Well, hello everyone, and welcome to another edition of the Weekly Rant uh, on the Road. Okay, whatever, audio is not going to be as good. I know the backdrop. I had this idea of doing this with the whole city of Monte Carlo in the back, but it just didn't work because it was like really, really bright. Um, anyway, uh, I'm coming to you right after finishing sixth in the high roller, the super high roller here in Monte Carlo, which made me about 310,000 euro. I've done really good in these super high rollers. I've got now a second, a third, a fourth, a fifth, a sixth, an eighth, and like a 14th. That's basically every single one that I've played. Um, I've never done worse than that. Disappointing finish, I'll tell you the hand. I paid six spots, so you know we kind of squeaked squeak, squeak in the money a little bit. I raised the button with Ace King of Clubs to 68,000. Tobias made it about 150,000 from the small blind. Justin Bonomo, who's the massive chip leader, made it like 405,000. And I had about 1.2, 1.3, 1.3 million shipped it in with the Ace King suited. He had pocket tens, 10 on the flop, me out the door, uh, another cash. But I mean, I really wanted to win, you know, but whatever. What are you going to do? So now I'm in my room. I've got a few minutes before I have to actually go do some more. Well, now that my schedule is freed up, PokerStar is like, by the way, you're free to do your interviews now. So I'm going to try to make this as quick as possible. I flew with British Airways for the fourth time. They lost my luggage out of six. I know, I know, right? You know, fool me once, fool me twice. I gave them like a two-year suspension, and then I decided to give them a chance again, and uh, I don't know that I can again, but I did get my bags. I had to go back to the airport and got it myself. As for food out here, I found a place in Menton, which is uh, literally another country. It's in France, 15-minute drive, and uh, it's called Loving Hut, which is awesome. Loving Hut is like the nuts for any vegan. It's a vegan chain, and uh, they don't deliver, but I found a way to make them deliver. Um, Euro talks. So they, um, they've been delivering for myself, some of the massage girls, also David Williams, who's decided recently to like give the whole vegan thing a try. I never thought that was going to happen. On the plane over here, I ended up watching the documentary um, Marley. And I've always been a Bob Marley fan. He's near and dear to my heart. If there's one guy dead or alive that I would have loved to have met, it would have been Bob. Um, inspirational dude. I mean, so much about the guy that I absolutely love. And I ended up crying through the whole documentary. So if you haven't seen it, check out iTunes. You can download it right now. It's pretty cheap. Give it a shot. And if you don't know much about Bob Marley, you will after watching this. Here's a mini tour of my digs here in uh, Monte Carlo. So here's the entrance. You can see I got a staircase, two floors up in this busy arch. And uh, you can't really see back there. That's like all sun. We got a uh, bathroom on the bottom floor. Nothing sexy or exciting about this. Just a toilet and a sink, but whatever. I was filming. Uh, there you see a little big screen TV. Kind of a necessity and pretty I any. Mean, Good room these days. Um, some artwork. I don't know if you're a big fan or not, but it's there. Plenty of couch space in case I decide to have like a ball and party one of these nights with the peeps. Um, you know, spacious, whatnot. So on our way to, well, let's see, the, that's gorgeous out there. Closer look at that TV that, I mean, I haven't even turned the damn thing on. I've really been working hard playing the tournament and whatnot, so over to the fridge area coming up real soon there's my vegan protein powder vegan bars protein cup thingy i bring that on the road anytime i plan on working out and i have it on our way to the balcony and i i mean i couldn't even see it was so bright so i was trying to film the chairs but i basically missed <laughs> so yeah i thought i was filming chairs no not so much lower you dummy okay oh there's a table you got that and here, I couldn't see anything. It was just bright sun, and um, well, there you see the beautiful city there. Um, I, I was trying to pan down, and I was way up in the air, okay? Like I said, I mean, I, I was blinded by the light. But as you can see, it's gorgeous. Just absolutely beautiful. That's my view. Um, I've had worse views, like in London. <laughs> so back into the room we go. Um, on our way up the stairs, a little more artwork. Uh, I kind of love this. I, this is the only place I've ever had a room that had like two floors. And, you know, I don't know. I think it's kind of cool. It gives it like a house feel. So upstairs we go. And I got in the bedroom another view of the ocean. It's just gorgeous, right? I mean, that alone is worth the price of admission. There's the bed where, you know, they play the magic happen. There ain't no magic happening there. The two big bags. I'm traveling like a lady these days. That's three weeks worth. Um, so I travel heavy. Um, and, I, you know, I'm like a little OCD with this stuff. So I, I pack 
and I put stuff away and then I feel like my mind is set. So we got the sock drawer, we got the under there drawer, we got shorts, we got, um, you know, t-shirts and whatnot. So I like to be organized. You got the iPad charging, my broken glasses, and of course, tissues in case I need to, um, you know, blow my nose or something like that. <laughs> Into the closet area. Uh, again, I like to put things away. That's my pants, belts, all put in one spot. You got the shirts. I didn't color coordinate this time, so I'm getting a little lazy. But uh, they're all in there for like a three-week trip. So I might have to rewear or wash. Luckily, I'm going to Toronto, so my brother's wife Ornella can do that. You got shoes, hats, you know, I'm all prepared. Into the bathroom we go. All these modern type bathrooms, I like simple. I don't like old fashioned anything. I wasn't a fan of Deauville, um, cause they had old fashioned stuff. There you see a spread of my stuff, all organized, put away. Le douche over here, which I use pretty much every day. And then the bathroom. There's one thing I've been wanting to talk about for a little bit, and um, it's my obsession with Monthly Nut. I've got a lot of friends who they've sort of rolled the right, they've, they've ridden the roller coaster of high stakes poker, and they've had a lot of money, and they haven't had a lot of money. And um, I always focus on Monthly Nut being such an important aspect of how successful you can and cannot be. And essentially, when I first moved out here, my Monthly Nut was maybe like $1,400. I would spend about seven, maybe even less. I'd spend $700 a month at Budget Suites. And so I, I knew I didn't have to make that much money to survive. What happens to people often is when they get some money, whether it's through investments or they start playing higher, they win a tournament, their monthly nut might go from $2,500 to like twenty dollars or $30,000 or even $40,000 a month. Now, if you're spending $40,000 a month, that means you have to make half a million dollars just to survive. That's a lot of money. And the, the hardest thing for a lot of people, aside from going down in stakes, let's say you know your bankroll gets smaller and you have to, you know, play half the size or whatever the case may be, is also learning how to live differently. It's way more important. So when I have friends that I know that have you know, gone through troubles, they say to me like, oh, you know, I'm ready to get my fee. I'm like, well, what's your monthly nut? And then they tell me their monthly nut. And I'm saying, you can't afford that monthly nut. If you want to be successful, you need to learn a way, you need to figure out a way to like lower that monthly nut significantly to a point where you're setting yourself up for success and not failure. Because if your monthly nut is fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 a month and you you know, don't have a bankroll to play the kind of games that you need to play, then you have to make some drastic changes to your life. And that's probably the most difficult thing, aside from the humbling aspect of playing smaller and having people look at you and go, oh, you know, he's playing smaller or whatever, which is a smart decision for people. It's much harder for people to change the way that they live. Maybe not have two cars, maybe not live, you know, in a baller neighborhood, maybe, you know, not all have all those things. And it's something that I've always been conscious of. My monthly nut has obviously raised a lot since I was a grinder, but, uh, if I ever needed to go back to grinding, I've thought about this. I could I could live in a one room apartment with a laptop and um, and grind. And I think it's important for a lot of those people to reset their mindset. It's similar like in a tournament when you're the chip leader and you're baller and you're kicking butt. Well, all of a sudden you're short again. You have to reset your mind and you have to like realize, okay, you can't be playing these types of hands. You have to adjust to your new situation. So monthly nut is my obsession. Whenever I talk to people, I'm like, okay, how much money can you beat this game per hour? Okay, and what's your monthly nut? How many hours a week or a month are you going to need to play? And then if that's feasible, it makes sense. Otherwise, it's like you're setting, you have to have a plan, okay? And not just a plan when you're rising to the top, but a plan for also when you're coming back down. The other thing I wanted to address also was Mike Sexton wrote a blog recently that said something to the effect of, you know, wake up and smell the coffee. And he was talking to, I think, a lot of the younger generation in terms of, you know, the way they dress at these final tables, you know, they don't shave or, you know, they wear scrubs and whatnot. And I think the problem is much bigger than what clothes that people are choosing to wear. I think it's a question of entitlement. When I started out in this industry uh, on the media side, uh, I did things with the World Poker Tour and other such things where I didn't get paid a penny. I did all these things and it was understandable. It's like I'm helping them out by offering them content and supporting them. And at the same time, they're offering me an opportunity to get the kind of exposure that could potentially work myself into you know, an opportunity to make some money. And I think a lot of the younger guys, when it comes to doing interviews and doing things that are outside of what they have to do, they break it down to a point of like, what's my ROI on making this move? And they think so much in terms of like, I don't need to do this interview or do I really need to do this interview and how much is it worth to me? Instead of just thinking, okay, the more, the more of these things that I do, the easier I am to get along with, the more often I show up on time for interviews, the more things I'm willing to do for free, the more likely you're going to create good relationships with those people that down the road might be writing you a paycheck. So I think it's just a mindset thing. It's more a question of like realizing that you're entitled to nothing. Just because people got sponsorship deals in the past for whatever they did 
Just because you're good at poker, and I've had this discussion with Kathy Lieber to a great extent, who's still number one on the all-time money list for women, it's not just about you know, being good at something. VJ Singh doesn't get sponsorship opportunities where Phil Mickelson and Tiger Woods do. It, it takes more than just being good at poker. It takes being agreeable and easy to work with. And uh, I think that's the one thing that I've seen the biggest difference is, is, that, is the people not necessarily seeing how important that aspect of branding yourself is. You know, you, the, more, the more times you snub the media, the less likely they're ever going to want to talk to you. Other thing I thought about while I was over here was uh, I've been really enjoying, I had a really good week in Las Vegas before coming out here where I was you know, getting up, I was working out a little bit, I was playing golf and I was playing in our soccer league, which is fun. And it made me realize like the, a perfect day to me is something that looks like I wake up at around 10, 10, 30 a.m., maybe work out a little bit, go play 18 holes, eat absolutely healthy, vegan, top-notch stuff, and then, you know, play soccer at night and just do things that are more athletically based. You just feel better about yourself when you're doing things that, are, you know, make you active. And realistically, if I could pick that perfect life, maybe when I'm 40 years old, it, it involves very little travel and a lot more time at home where, you know, this soccer league that I started with some of the guys like Christy Arnett, good Donnie good Peters, good and Gary Gates, you know, guys that we within poker. It's been very so much day. fun. You know, we're three and one right now. And I, I seriously think look. about, could I good fly look. back to make the game on Thursday and then fly back to my, it's stupid, but I actually thought about that. That's just how messed up my brain is. Yeah. And that's where the monthly nut thing <laughs> doesn't compute because that would cost like stupid money. Uh, and it's just a stupid idea to do. Um, but I'm afraid we're going to lose this week because we're missing very key components of our team. But anyway, to, to me, a, a real perfect life is one in which I'm doing less travel and I can actually have some sort of a routine. The one thing I've struggled with my whole life pretty much is, since I've been a poker player, is routine. And I love routine and uh, it's much more difficult to have routine when you travel as much as I do. Unfortunately, it was a pretty slow news week. I mean, not a lot <laughs> happened in the poker world, right? Okay. No comment. Okay. But I do want to get to the D-Gen story of the week, as I do every week. This week's D-Gen story is about a guy who you may remember as being one of the online phenoms. His name was uh, Eric123, Eric Sagstrom, young kid who um, was obviously, you know, big time online player. And uh, he flew from Sweden to Vegas at one point when Lufthansa used to offer, you could play online. You could actually like get online where you can't now. There's no international flights that do that. But for a time, Lufthansa was offering that. So Eric was playing pretty high, especially at those times. This was years and years ago. He's playing in a really, you know, pretty big game and decides, well, he's got a first class flight. So he might as well play some online poker and pay for his flight on the way. <laughs> so his flight maybe cost about eight or nine thousand. When it was all said and done, his flight ended up cost. He might he may have paid for the most expensive first class flight of all time. He ended up losing two hundred fifty thousand online on his way to Vegas, just trying to pay the eleven thousand for his flight. I'd have to say that that's the most money ever lost on a, on a, on a transatlantic flight. <laughs> two hundred fifty thousand—that's a lot. So obviously this weekly rant is going to look a lot different than the typical weekly rant that I do, but I'll do the best that I can. Obviously, I was very busy playing the super high roller this week. And uh, I'm playing the main event tomorrow and then of course the 25k. So I'm gonna be a little busy Hopefully I'll catch up at some point when I get back to Las Vegas and we'll give you a proper weekly rant But hey better than nothing right till next week